Good evening, everybody. I am proud to be here talking about the remarkable resilience with our great group of visionary doctors this evening, or maybe it's still afternoon for you. Um, and this is really about eye care insights in our challenging economy right now. So first off, I wanted to um, introduce the Contact Lens Institute, which is a US industry association for soft contact lenses. And our goal at, at CLI is to advance the latest innovations in safe and effective contact lens and lens care products and services. We've got particular focus on healthy wear and care and also encouraging the growth of contact lens fitting. And our goal is to help the eye care community evolve to meet um, all of our needs, especially as current and prospective patient attitudes and behaviors change. Our See Tomorrow initiative, it helps the eye care community better understand their current and prospective patients by pinpointing opportunities for contact lens fitting and contact lens growth. Uh, we began this, this effort back in 2021 by uncovering consumer sentiments specific to lifestyle changes that resulted from the pandemic and giving practitioners like all of you new ways to engage patients. And this just this spring, we looked at common myths and misconceptions that US consumers had regarding contact lenses. And now with the continued enthusiastic response that we've had from all of you, we're gonna share our latest research on a topic that's affecting all of us, which is eye care in this challenging optometry. And this year, I have to say, we've been really privileged to work with more than a dozen eye care community leaders, our Contact Lens Institute 2022 visionaries. This diverse group represents a range of practice settings, research interests, specializations, and educational pursuits with members based in cities and towns across the US. Every Contact Lens Institute visionary has committed to helping raise awareness of contact lens prescribing benefits as well as encouraging healthy wear and care habits. Selected in part for their ability to connect with professional peers, they participate in initiatives that promote best practices, tools, data, and clinical and practice management insights. So tonight, we've got four of those visionaries who are joining us. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nathan Benia Warford from Bright Eyes Family Vision Care. Dr. Melanie Denton Dombrowski from Salisbury Eye Care and Eyewear, Dr. Chris Levens from the Southern College of Optometry, and Dr. Caitlin Morrison from InFocus Specialty Contact Lens and Vision Solutions. So tonight, we're going to talk about a survey and analysis conducted by global research firm Protege on behalf of the CLI. This online field work was um, undertaken this summer back in August, and the figures are representative of all US contact lens wearers aged 18 and over, unless we've stated otherwise. Our total sample size was 2,458 adults, and 251 of those used contact lenses. And just to give you some background, these sam this sample was balanced to our general population in the US, you can see the demographics of the age and household income on the screen here. And it was a really great representation of how people wear their contact lenses and glasses. So some preferred one over the other, um, or some wore them equally. And this is also a great representative sample of the types of contact lenses that we see out there, whether it be daily disposable, two week, monthly, um, or RGP or scleral lenses, as you can see on the screen. So before we go in even further, I want to tell you where you can get more information, which is the full report on seetomorrownow.com. And it has much of what we're going to talk about tonight and even more data. For those of you who have read it, um, you're telling us that it's an invaluable resource for your teams. So let's get to some of these key findings. Um, we're going to go through a few of them. and and gather information and conversation from our visionary panelists. And again, our goal tonight is to help all of you convert these data and insights into actions, into tangible, real, valuable tips that can help you and your practices thrive despite our new economic challenges. So let's 
um, go through. And maybe let's do a quick introduction of our panelists too before we start this conversation. So um, Dr. Denson Dombrowski, I will start with you first since you're on my Great. <laughs> Hi, so did you just want me to say what yeah, a quick introduction? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so I'm Dr. Melanie Denton Dombrowski. I practice in Salisbury, North Carolina, which is a small to medium sized town. Um, my practice is one that I started cold back in 2016, and I see all manner of patients, um, contact lenses, but I also have a really big dry eye practice as well. Perfect. Thank you. Dr. Morrison, how about you? All right, hi everyone, thanks for joining. Um, my name is Caitlin Morrison. I started a cold start uh, specialty contact lens practice in 2020, best year to start a practice. Um, and I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we do basically all types of specialty contact lenses only, no glasses, um, lots of different interesting eyeballs. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Levin. Hi, I'm Chris Levens. I've been practicing for 27 years. I've been an optometric private practice, an ophthalmology practice. I served in the United States Air Force. And for the last almost 22 years, I've been a professor at Southern College of Optometry where I teach, do research, but my main role is to oversee our on-campus patient care facility. Perfect, thank you so much. And Dr. Benia Warford. Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Nathan Benia Warford. I go by Dr. Nate, because Benia Warford is a mouthful. I practice in Tampa, Florida, and I uh, specialize in children's vision. Uh, that's vision therapy, uh, myopia control, ortho K. We do see all uh, all ages uh, here as well, but those you know, those are really my my passions. And um, you know, I'm just great uh, to be here uh, with uh, everybody uh, on the panel. Thank you so much, and um, we're excited to hear from all of you. Okay, so let's start with our first key finding. Um, and what we found was that in the US, Americans overwhelmingly value their contact lenses and eyeglasses. So this is, this is great news for us. And when we asked them to value 26 different products and services, the survey responses, respondents told us that contact lenses at 84% and eyeglasses at 75% were extremely or very important to them, um, more than any other category that we, we saw. So um, great news is all of you should be really confident in your prescribing habits and that despite what, we're, what we may be feeling in, in the economic conditions right now, we're in a great place to provide eye care. So let me hand it over to the panel and, and ask you a question. So these, these survey results show the importance that patients place on their eyesight. So no matter where you are across the country or the type of practice that you're in, um, and the fact that contact lens spending continues to remain steady, this should give us confidence um, to continue to prescribe what's best for our patients. So how have you guys noticed this in your practice and um, any Anything that you've seen over the last, uh, I'll say, few months related to this topic? Uh, Dr. Nate, I think you're on mute. There, I'll go there first. You, go. Um, you know, I, I think about this almost never, you know, do patients come in, you know, to my office, you know, and say, you know, any version of, uh, either, you know, I really would like a, a lower quality contact, you know, I mean, that just, they never, and they, don't, and they really honestly don't even say, you know, I, I'm pretty happy with my contacts, but is there anything that's like this, but just cheaper? Because I think that they know intuitively what they're asking for is, I would like a lower quality contact. I mean, it, it you know, even, even now, right now, when there's, you know, some maybe unpredictable uh, you know, uh, environment, you know, right now, I'm just, I'm just not seeing that. Patients really value what they, you know, are wearing, how they see, they feel like that's important. That's what that data shows. And that's what I, you know, experience in the exam room. So as long as we are not planting the seed, you know, inadvertently, 
then I think that it's going to be very much business as usual. Great points, great points. I agree with that, Dr. I would agree. I definitely I'm sorry to jump in, Caitlin. No um, yeah, I, I, I think that this, this survey question, a lot of times when we're posing a question, the first thing that we tend to do is internalize. And then what if we were asked that question? And if I were a patient going to any y'all for my exam and you said, Chris, sorry, but you could never wear contacts again. I'd be like, wait, what? There's no way that's true. And then if I were further thought about, well, what might I give up in a trade to keep my contact lenses? It would be a whole world of things. And so when we see this list, it's really remarkable. And like Dr. Nate said, it gives us confidence as providers that patients really value their eyesight. They value their eyes and they have tremendous value in being a continual and really perpetual contact lens user for many, many, many years. Yeah, I would say how many times in our practice have somebody said to you, my eyes are really important to me or my vision is really important to me. I have that said to me all the time. Um, and uh, I, I feel like we still have to provide the what we think is going to be the best option for them, regardless of the economy, regardless of what we think they might want, given like a certain financial situation. I think everyone wants the best option. Um, and then after that, if they, you know, have this best option and they want to go for something a little bit more cost effective, like a monthly lens versus a daily lens, then they can always make that choice on their own with our guidance. But it's nice to know that that's so valuable to them. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you guys all bring up great points about, um, especially Dr. Morrison, talking about what you would prescribe as their healthcare provider first, and then let them make the choice about their eyes and how they value that based on where they are, right? And, and what we see from the survey is that overwhelmingly they value things related to their eyes over, over other items like vacation, um, certainly gambling. Although, I don't know, I, a few of us may, may have bought a, a Powerball ticket over the last few weeks. Um, but certainly the, you know, having um, contact lenses and glasses ranked as one, as the most important, um, something that they would be least likely to give up under the economic pressures that they're seeing should reinforce um, all of the great work that, that we're doing as eye care providers. So let's move on to the next um, key, key point here. So let's bring that up. And you know, it's, it's one thing to say, what do you value? And then it's another thing to say, what would you actually be spending your dollars on? And so eye care spending shows that we've got the strong resilience um, in, within eye care because fewer than one in 10 of the US residents are reducing spending on contact lenses and prescription eyeglasses, um, even in the face of inflation. And this is among the most re resilient of all the categories surveyed. So similar vein to what we saw um, in the previous slide before, um, but as we look at all these categories, when, when we're thinking about reducing spending, um, certainly things we see up there, dining out, um, new clothing, uh, even alcohol and tobacco products. Does this surprise any of you or um, are you seeing anything differently in your practices? So I'll kick this one off. Um, yeah, I, you know, we're not seeing any slowdown in our patient purchasing glasses and contacts. Um, in fact, we have grown every year since the pandemic. And so, oops, I have a kitty with me. <laughs> um, but I was going to mention there was a data point earlier that I really liked at the very beginning, talking about how patients really value both their glasses and their contact lenses and how many patients actually utilize both either on a daily basis or very frequently. Um, and that's something that I see in my practice as well. In fact, the way that I talk to patients at the end of their exam, this is how I end the exam. I say, 
you know, I have two responsibilities to you as your eye doctor. I have to make sure you're seeing as clearly and comfortably as you can and that your eyes are healthy today and going forward. And in the vision side of things, on that side of things, um, you have multiple ways to see. And I would encourage you to have backup glasses. And, you know, I've changed the way I say that. I used to say like, oh, just they don't got to be pretty. You just got to have them. And now I say, no, like invest in backup glasses that you love. Invest in dailies. Um, even if you're primarily a glasses wearer, you can use those dailies for vacations and, um, and fun things and things like that. So um, I definitely have not seen a slowdown in my practice. I think patients, to all of your points, find contacts as important as ever. I, I've seen the same thing. And, and we've talked about this before, that there's hardly anything good that came out of the pandemic. But as medical providers, one of the things that has perpetuated was patients thinking about their health and thinking about healthful ways to live life. And in this realm, it's healthy ways to wear contact lenses successfully and healthy use of glasses as well. And so I, I, it, it, it's, a, it's a common interaction that's occurring every single day that I hope doesn't slow down because it's a great way for us to get an avenue to have these really important discussions. Those are great points. And, you know, I think one, of, I'll just add that is that I do feel that doctors, um, doctors of optometry are seen as frontline healthcare workers as well. So coming out of the pandemic, really coming to all of you for, I, you know, not just for a new pair of glasses or a new um, prescription, but really thinking about their total eye health as well. So great points. Dr. Morrison, were you going to add to that? Oh, I think I can just echo the sentiments. Um, just coming from a specialty contact lens practice specifically, um, a lot of the things that we do with sclerals, et cetera, I know doc, uh, Dr. Nate does a lot of ortho-K, um, those things are definitely higher in cost. But what I found over the years is I used to introduce everything to my patients, like here are all of your options. Which one do you think would be the best that fits best with you? And then now what I do is I just start at, what is going to be the absolute best for the health of your eye and for the best seeing vision possible? That's what I'm recommending. And then again, like if you want something a little bit different, we can go down those avenues, but this is what I would really recommend. This is what's going to be the best. Um, I don't do glasses myself, but I do recommend that even patients with conditions like keratoconus, transplants, try to have some sort of backup glasses. I think it's important if they get an eye infection, if it's possible for them. So I would say that just recommending the best to the best is for me the most, has been the most successful. And I haven't, like um, Dr. Denton, seen a, I haven't seen a slowdown at all in, in patients. They're like more focused on their vision and health and um, wanting to see more clearly than, than ever, I think. If I could just um, you know, add to that, um, just talking about especially uh, care, you know, even though you know, there's been talk for quite a while in the, in the news about uh, economic uncertainty and you know, what's going to come, um, I'm seeing I'm busier than ever with, with specialty care. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, it's been steadily increasing for you know, a very long time. You know, uh, one of my staff members, they, you know, they said, well, how long have you been doing ortho okay. And so we looked it up at the very first lens I ordered was, you know, 15 years ago. And, you know, we used to be very rare. It used to be every few months I would order, you know, lenses. Well, now it's like every single day. And that isn't currently showing any signs of slowing down um, because patients want what's best for themselves. They want what's best, you know, for their family. And in not even specialty, if, you know, not even a super specialized, but I think generally speaking, Patients really know that the, the lens offerings that exist today are vastly superior to what even was available 10 years and certainly was better than what was available 20 years. They don't want to go back. They, they you know, if they're older, they remember what that was like. Um, and they have, they have zero interest in, in revisiting um, less comfortable, more dry, more prone to um, infiltrates and, you know, infection, you know, that's not something that they're interested in. Yeah. So it's great to hear that, that, that this is, um, 
despite the economic pressures that that we might be hearing about on the news, that th this hasn't seemed to affect your practices or how um, patients are showing how they value their their vision, which I do think also is another, you know, Dr. Liebens was talking about this. So I think another silver lining is people really understand how much they use their eyes, um, especially over the last couple of years and, and understand that vision, healthy sight is um, very important to um, to how they want to live their lives. So let's let's go to the next key finding. Um, and we know that that behaviors beyond purchasing trade-offs um, may change with economic pressure. So we've we've heard that it doesn't seem to be affecting um, us directly right now. But we also did ask respondents how their contact lens habits might shift in light of financial pressures. And as an eye care community, we should prepare for this and get ahead of it. So um, what have you and your teams, maybe your, your staff, um, do, are you proactive in talking to patients about some of the things that, some of the behaviors that they may modify in light of financial pressures? Yeah, I, I would say 100% yes. And, and I think the approach that we've that we've taken for some time now is always try to arm our patients with, well, what if the what if phenomenon? In other words, there may be a time when you decide to do something, and if you do this, here are the repercussions and the potential outcomes that you might face. Because if you don't tell people that, how are they possibly going to know? We know, and we think it's second nature that when you overwear a contact lens or you don't disinfect the contact lens or you top off a solution, what the ramifications are. But to them, they say, well, it seems like a good idea right now, so I'm going to give it a go. But if we tell them on the front end, plant that seed, now it's a memory, they know, oh, hmm, maybe I need not to do this. I'll take my strategies elsewhere. I would say that um, we try to be proactive about this type of thing as well. So, and try to make it as easy on myself and my staff as possible because, you know, we're all really busy and we have busy practices and we're seeing patient after patient. And sometimes it's hard to go and cover everything. And also it's really hard for patients to retain everything that you tell them as well. So we have handouts for everything. We have a handout for contact lens wearers where we, we go through all of it. I go through every single thing briefly. Don't use water. Here's how to wash your case effectively. It's all written out on the form. We give it to them so they can read it later. For um, a lot of patients with uh, a lot of solution needs, like say sclerals, we actually send them an email after they leave us as well. So we give them a handout and we send them an email that says all those exact things on the email as well. So they get so much information about how to be the healthiest with your eyes. And I go through this with even patients who are like, I've worn lenses for 50 years. Um, and I talk to them and they're rinsing their lenses underwater. They're like doing all sorts of things. And they're like, oh, no one's ever told me that before. So I go through it with every single person, regardless of how long they've worn lenses. And to make it easier on yourself, just type it up and give it to them in a handout. So I have this saying in my practice, and it fits because my practice is actually in an old Victorian house, but I like to say that this is our house to my staff and that we get to control the message in our house, right? So whenever possible at every patient touch point, we want to be educating our patients and giving them information that's going to promote their health and promote healthy wearing at every step of the way. So. Truly, my staff, I mean, obviously, like many practice owners, I invest in them heavily in terms of training. Um, much of the onus actually falls on them, whether it's presenting the option of wearing contact lenses, doing the education about wear and care. Um, but I also have invested in things like Rendia. So Rendia is a great program that we utilize in our exam rooms, and we've made different playlists. So if you're a contact lens wearer in my practice, if you're even thinking about it, while you're sitting and waiting on the doctor, there's um, short little playlists that play um, in loops, you know, educating patients about proper lens wear and care and what not to skimp on, you know, what, you know, never sleep in your lenses and things like that. And patients have remarked to me that that's incredibly helpful, that it just sort of passively plays because they can consume it sort of as they're sitting there. Sometimes as the doctor, we, you know, I 
tend to overwhelm. And um, I know that. So I try to give different ways to learn because not everyone will retain, um, you know, verbal instructions from me every single time. Those are all great reminders. And I, I will do a shameless plug here because I met, as I mentioned before, um, at the CLI, we uh, one of our, our primary goals is uh, around healthy wear and care of contact lenses. So we've made it really easy for practices to communicate healthy wear and care through three simple steps. So patient and practice tools, tools are also available for free on the easywayprogram.org. So based on our new data, I mean, this is, we've got great tips from our visionaries as well, but this is another resource if this is not something <clears throat> that you've got um, in your practice set up already. I will say also um, at the end, we'll be doing some Q&A with our, our visionary doctors here. So feel free to submit questions through the Q&A button um, below and uh, type in your question and we'll try to get to all of them. At, at the end of the, the program here. So let's think about, let's go to that next one. And our fourth highlight here is, you know, cost is not a major factor in shaping the importance that consumers place on their contact lenses. We talked a little bit about this before. Um, and there's absolutely an opportunity to create more affinity through services, pricing and other ancillary products that, that all of you may have in your practices. And that really does start with, with being able to communicate the offerings that we have and um, perceive as low value, but consumers see them adding as much more value to that contact lens experience. So we see some of these top value ads as for example, offering a discount on eyeglasses, um, also you know, providing samples, home delivery, all of those things. Um, and I'll just throw in here too, is we also know, um, we talked a little bit before about the importance of staff. So I'll hand it over to the, the doctors to talk about this, but um, additionally, is, are there any things that your staff are doing uh, in as we talk about wrapping up services along with with the contact lenses and, and glasses too? I can start this one. So um, we have a large pediatric population from the uh, Phoenix Children's Hospital, and they are kids who are wearing contact lenses of any shape and size. And so when we were first starting out, we were seeing these kids and then every time they would come in, it was kind of sporadic. Um, maybe they would come in a couple weeks later for their follow-up, maybe a month later. Kids and parents have very varied schedules. Um, it's hard to get them in as often. So we were thinking to ourselves, you know, and every time they came in, they'd be like, what do I owe you? And we'd be like, well, nothing, because it's just a follow-up on your contacts. So we decided that to promote value on the first visit, what we would do is have myself and then also my front desk staff tell the patients and their parents, most of the parents, um, that what you're gonna get, this is all that you're getting with this. So here is our contact lens fitting. You're going to get your first pair of lenses for free. You know, for free, you're going to get um, all the follow-ups within a month after dispensing covered. You can come back as many times as you want. Your child can come back for insertion removal anytime that they want. Um, I didn't ever add the trial lenses if they, lose a pair, but I have tons of pediatric patients who forget to tell their parents. And so we give them trial lenses in the meantime. And I think that they love it. Um, and so being proactive and telling them that they're like, oh, wow, what value? Like, what am I getting um, for this service? And they appreciate that, even though that's something that we all naturally have always done in our entire practice is do this whole follow-up schedule. So that's something that we've done that's been really successful, I think, in just perceiving value. Dr. Morrison, based on what you just said, was something similar that I started doing as soon as I read this data. It, I couldn't believe that patients were so excited about trial lenses. And so I immediately pivoted and I quit using that word because when, when, when I'm a patient, I think, oh, I'm going to give you a trial. I'm like, all right, well, you just got this free from the company. Or it's like my dentist give me the same toothbrush he gives everybody else. But now I, can, I flip the script. I tell my patients, hey, 
I'm giving you your customized lenses, exactly what you're going to purchase to hold you over, to get you started today so you don't have to wait for the shipment that's going to get to your house directly. And so it's not the same toothbrush that everybody gets. It's customized to them. I just threw out the word trial. And I would never have known that had I not seen this data. I really like that. I might start using that too. Uh, I totally agree with that point. And I, um, I tell my staff something similar when they're, when they're new to us is uh, we always want to tell patients, you know, that, you know, we're going to help them with their unique situation. Because even if it's a very straightforward scenario that we've seen a thousand times, uh, you know, even if it's literally just minus 250 sphere, to them, it is a unique situation. So it's not misrepresenting the truth to say like, well, we have to factor in all of these things because we do. And the key thing here is unless we tell them that, they're never going to know. They're not going to know what we're thinking. We're not going to know all of the you know options that we've gone through. But you know, if you tell them, like, well, there's there's many there's many ways to go here. But just like one of you said, I don't remember you know which one. I think it was probably Dr. Denton. Um, you know, I have thought about your case, and this is what I think is the best. You know, for you, we can talk about other options if you'd like. And, you know, this is why, you know, and it's similar to like just what when you're looking at the contact lens underneath the, the you know, the slit lamp and you're looking for the, for the fit, they have no earthly idea what you're doing. You're just shining lights at them, you know, so you can either be quiet and you can just look and they don't know, or you can say, oh, well, it's centering very beautifully. Oh, it's very nice movement. Oh, I see how it's, you know, it's really retaining, uh, you know, it, it's moisture. I'm sure that that feels great just by telling them that, you know, it doesn't take any extra time. And now they have some sense of like, oh yeah, these really are good. You know what I mean? And it's just, it's not difficult to do. It's just, you have to remember to do it because we've all done it so many times, but it's new to them and it's important to them. So oh, um, I, I have a confession. I, you know, when I started in practice and I started selling contact lenses out of my private practice, I have to admit that at the beginning, I felt sort of frustrated because the margins with contact lenses are smaller. Um, a lot of times there's so many touch points with patients that it can be very frustrating. And so very early on in practice, I decided to figure out how to just crush contacts the best I could. And I was really excited to see all this data because a lot of the strategies that I use are on here. And it has made contact so much easier for my practice. So what I found was that patients were commoditizing contacts in their mind. And if you let patients do that, they totally will. If you don't make them special, you don't make the experience special, and you don't have these extra add-ons for patients, it's, then it's just a commodity and I can get it anywhere. But when you really craft your practice around their experience, doing things like you know, making a global fit period so that any follow-ups are included. Um, you know, something I do, I present dailies and monthlies to every single patient. But even if you're choosing monthlies and the patient's fairly convinced that's what they're going to do, I will also send them home with dailies because that's what I would want. If I'm a, I'm a minus 425 sphere, if you give me one pair of contacts to hold me over and I lose one, I can't really drive or work anymore. So I always give my patients dailies as well. And that little trick has helped me convert so many monthly patients over to dailies. And it also just feels really like I care about the patient, right? Because I'm like, listen, you're a 650. I don't want you to be down to one lens. And that promotes healthy lens wear as well. So it's it's just like subtly putting in these little these little tricks to get patients to sort of be trained to how you want to, them to wear contacts. We also, you know, I saw it coming five years ago or six years ago, and I have early adopted to just about every online contact lens ordering platform. There is an eye care. I had Lens Butler when that was around, and a good friend of mine. Um, 
uh, was the creator of Dr. Contact Lens. And now we're seeing manufacturers come to the table and distributors come to the table with their own platforms for eye care providers to just not be left out of the loop. So, and that has been amazing. When you actually get the patient registered in your clinic and they get the email to order from you, now they're getting emails from you to reorder their lenses on time instead of going out to some third party platform and getting in that loop and potentially falling into the online eyeglasses trap and all of that. I'd say a couple of things I also do to just promote some some value, just kind of piggybacking off what um, uh, Dr. Denton was saying was that um, the first, one of the things I do is similar to Dr. Uh, Benia Warford is that, um, when I have them at the Pentacam, which is my corneal topographer, my general fitting philosophy is if you're fitting a regular soft contact lens, a commercially available lens, it's basically flat K plus one millimeter equals base curve. And that's a pretty easy way if it's like a seven, eight millimeter, you pick up an eight, eight, and then that's gonna be like the best base curve for them. And that's, you know, just a generalization. But I talked to my patients about that being, saying, okay, here you have, um, a small diameter cornea, or you have a large diameter cornea, or a kind of normal diameter cornea, you have a flatter uh, corneal, so cornea, so when we pick a lens for you, we're going to pick something that's flatter, just so this kind of takes them through the process of what's going through your mind, which is so second nature to us, um, as well as offering like, hey, maybe you have an 11.1 millimeter um, corneal diameter. Maybe you're going to be better in a custom soft lens. Those are all things that you can say, you know, maybe you'd be like this. We can try this first. And then if you ever fail out of that, we can try something different. Um, and then uh, the second thing that I, I did was that I, I was thinking about my patients and what kind of patients that I have. And I have very, very busy patients. And so anything to make their lives easier is really, I think, um, a value add for them. And so um, what I do is anytime a soft contact lens patient comes in, I just already have priced out an annual supply of their lenses. And then my um, front desk staff, when they're checking out, they'll say, hey, do you want us to order you just an annual supply of the lenses? We'll just ship them right to your house for free. And they're like, oh, okay. And that's really, really helpful. Um, obviously you get the contact lens sale. As, as Dr. Denton was saying, it's not like um, the margin are sometimes low. I actually just increased everything because I was like, if I'm going to take the time to do it, I might as well just increase everything. So we're not close to 1-800 contacts whatsoever. But um, I think the value add of just having the uh, someone order them for you who knows your prescription, you don't have to put in stuff online, they order it right to your house, that my patients have been really, really enjoying that. Yes, you you all bring up great tips and, and points. Um... And I would say, you know, love the idea of personalization, especially as you go through that exam. And we're, you know, we're taking all this information and gathering it in our heads anyways. And so if we can just speak out loud and talk to the patients and walk them through what we're doing, it, it definitely brings more value to what you're doing as a doctor during their exam, but also how you're personalizing um, the prescription and the products uh, that you're offering them afterwards. Um, I also love what Dr. Benio Warford was saying about, you know, we do this every day. We forget that, especially if it's a new contact lens patient, this is new to them. And there's sometimes there's some anxiety and there's the ability for us to um, make this a, such a great experience for them. But sometimes we have to get outside our own heads where, where we, you know, this is something that we've been doing for many, many years and, and not necessarily new to us. Um, Dr. Denton Dombrowski, I just wanna make sure I didn't, didn't miss one of your points. Oh, I was gonna say, I love what Dr. Morrison said about how she's really bringing in her expertise in specialty lenses and her equipment that she has and topography. Like I don't even have topography, but you know what I do as a dry eye specialist, I do my biography on everybody. And as we know, um, MGD is a major reason for contact lens dropout in established wearers. And so I am proactively, that's like my specialist spin on it is we're always looking at your meibomian glands and how they're doing. And um, so it's just really interesting to hear, like, you know, as we specialize in different things, how we take that spin into how we fit the everyday soft lenses as well. 
No, and that's a great segue um, into our, our next topic, which is um, one of the things that we know is soft contact lens penetration in the US is only around 10 to 13 percent of the total US vision corrected population. So there's a huge opportunity for us to increase um, new wearers and maybe even contact lens wearers who have dropped out of contact lenses, perhaps because they didn't have their meibomian glands uh, addressed. And so part of our research asked why people aren't currently wearing lenses. And some of the responses were expected, but others were, were a little eye-opening for us. So one of the common things themes is that we as the eye care community need to build that bridge from what we know what customers and patients don't understand. Um, something made all, you know, this is easier with the data that we've got in front of us now, as well as the, the continuous stream of new products that we see on the market that offer better wearing experiences. So all of you touched upon these points earlier. So as we look at some of these, um, the findings and some of the, the data points, you know, one of the things that stood out to me is that 61% don't like the idea of putting something in their eyes. Now, when I was in practice, the, the, what the patients described to me was almost like they thought of a gas perm lens of that like turtle shell or something going on in their eyes. So are there some of the things that, that you guys are doing in your practice to proactively address this? Or are there any of these that stand out to you that maybe you or your staff could proactively address? I have something that kind of goes along with, oh, sorry, Nathan, um, goes along with like the kid aspect because kids are always scared to touch their eyes and it's always the first time they've ever done it. So what I do is generally because my pediatric population has really high prescriptions, I have to order um, special lenses for them. So um, we have a wait period time between when I first see them and when we first get the lenses. So on our first exam, even though I don't have the lenses in the office for them, what I do is I say, hey, I'm just gonna grab a lens. And then my um, assistant's gonna grab a lens as well. And you guys are just gonna practice like coming close to your eye, holding the lids, touching your eye. If you can put the contacts in, great. If you can't, no worries, because we're going to do it at your next exam anyways. This is just going to get you close. And then we have them go home and watch videos so that they can practice before they come in for the dispensing appointment. And that way they kind of have like, they know they're getting contacts anyway, so they're, they're not as scared when they come back in for the contacts, but we've already practiced with them, so they have that familiarity. Yeah, <clears throat> actually, I was going to say um, almost exactly the same thing. Um, it's very rare that they uh, first hear about contact lenses, and that's the same time we're, we're fitting them. So there is this time period. So they can watch videos of other kids their age, you know, like, look how easy this is. And they can see it and they, you know, can practice touching their, their eyelashes and holding their eyes open because a lot of them, you know, especially the boys have like never done that like ever, you know, they have no idea what it is. Um, another thing that when I'm talking to a, a child, um, you know, I don't really call them contact lenses. I mean, I mentioned contact lenses, but I basically say it's a little bubble that you put on your eye. You know, a bubble sounds way more fun, you know, than, you know, this lens that they have no idea, you know, what, what it is. And that seems to, you know, that seems to get a, a more, a more positive reaction. And I also, you know, try to bring in that, that social proof a little bit. Almost every child knows somebody who wears contact lenses, a friend in their class, mom, dad, aunt, and uncle, you know what I mean? And, I'm, and I, so I ask them like point blank, what do they think of their contacts? And they really don't know because that other piece person doesn't really talk about them very much. But the fact that they're wearing them, they're like, well, they probably, you know, like them. And so, you know, that all of that sort of demystifies it a little bit. And the other thing, um, because I do see, you know, kids, um, you know, all day, mostly, um, is when I, I mean, I'll start talking about contact lenses really, you know, early, and these aren't necessarily the super high scripts that Dr. Morrison was talking about. But even when they're like, you know, five or six, I'll just be like, oh, yeah. And at some point, you know, you know, when they're doing more, have more activities, you know, they may be interested in, in wearing contacts. And parents are like, no way, absolutely not. And I'm like, absolutely. You know, contact lenses are so much better. So if you plant that seed early, then by the time they're eight or nine, it does not seem 
outlandish. Yeah, I've, I've started telling almost every single patient, regardless of age, that did you know you're a great candidate for contact lenses? And before they can balk, I already start talking and say, you know what? People just like you think they can't touch their eyes. They can't put them in. They just can't imagine this, but they feel great. You'll see great. You'll get really good at it. And I'll always keep you in the best lenses, kind of planting the seed of perpetual upgrades. And the last thing I share with them is so far, the oldest patient that I fit in multifocal contacts who never wore contact lenses in her life before was 87 years old. If she can do it, you can do it. The one, the data point that's got to break all of our hearts, seriously, is the, my doctor never talked to me about contact lenses because to me, that just like, I mean, it breaks my heart. That is absolutely not the goal. I have a saying in my practice and you guys have all said it too. The day you plant the seed is not the day you eat the fruit. And so with every single patient, I'm telling them what's up, what's coming. If you're in your late thirties, we're talking about presbyopia and even that there's contact lens and glasses options when we get there. Um, kids, same thing. First pair of glasses, maybe that's where we're starting, but you're going to be a great candidate for contacts and um, when you're ready, you know, when you're motivated. Um, I was trying to think, you know, Dr. Levin said too about the technology thing, I always try to put patients in a new lens. Um, someone told me very early on, you want to be the what's new doc. You want to be the one that's like, you know, not just, oh, your lenses are fine. We'll just leave them the same. Never, never, never. My big thing is, even if there's not something new for you, I'm going to say, hey, listen, you're still in the best lens for you. Um, but I'm excited because next year, I think I'm going to have a new one for you. There's a new Torrid Daily coming out and I'll just like plant that seed and get them excited because it really makes them feel like you're thinking of them and their specific needs. And it really makes them feel special. I do have a little story to piggyback off that. Um, uh, there was a patient that I just saw and she was wanting a prosthetic contact lens for one eye to block out her vision. And, um, just, I just happened to take both, she was wearing a contact lens in the other eye, just a regular soft toric lens. And I happened to take out the eye and I stained both of the eyes to take her pressure. And when I did that, I noticed that nasal temporally, it was squishing her conjunctiva. So the lens was super tight. And I took a picture of it because I have the slit lamp camera, which is a great way to educate patients um, and demonstrate value. And I took a picture of it with a stain. And I said, are you comfortable in this contact lens? And she's like, well, eh, not kind of, not really. And I was like, do you want to do just like a new contact lens for this eye? And so it got us just, I was going to do the contact lens for the one eye. And then the other eye was like, listen, like I can do any number of lenses in my office. I can do customs, like just make it so that it would fit you a little bit better, maybe be more comfortable. I did the exact same thing recently with my, um, with my uncle. They were, his lenses were kind of moving a little bit more than expected, even though they were a pretty um like a tight base curve and I was like do you see well like do you think that you see well because I'm seeing 2020 on you but do you feel like you see well and he's like no never felt like I've seen well at all and I was like well you should have told me that like years ago but sure um and so we put him into a different lens that was a little bit more uh advanced and I think they really uh, people really appreciate it when you just bring it up so those are in you know instances where you're just you're upgrading them to the next coolest best lens but you're also doing it for like this is what i'm seeing and you have a health reason and and they i think they tend to like that yeah that is a great point and you know at least from the data that we saw from for lapsed users that was the number one reason is that they're not comfortable so you probably saved that patient from dropping out of their contact lenses by proactively addressing it right um let's see so Thinking about those lapse wearers as well, I just one of the data points that I saw that was interesting is that people weren't dropping out of contact lenses necessarily because they were too expensive. So some of the reasons, of course, that we, you know, especially with new wearers as they're going through that process is 
Um, that second one on there for reason for lapsed use was that the, the trouble inserting and, and um, removing their lens. But certainly the top one was that they, they didn't find they're comfortable. So I love all the ideas um, that you guys have about introducing, making sure you're introducing new technology to them. Um, Dr. Levens, love your, your 87 year old multifocal contact lens patient is a new wearer. So lots of great opportunities for new wearers and for patients who, who've previously worn them and not haven't been successful. And I wanted to add to that just because I see so many dry eye patients and severe dry eye patients, you know, just because lenses aren't comfortable doesn't mean that they can never ever wear them. And sometimes it's a matter of rethinking, like I think sometimes people have in their head, well, I can't be a contact lens wearer because I can't tolerate them 14 hours a day, right? But that doesn't necessarily, you can't wear contact lenses sometimes as one of your options. And many of my dry eye patients have been told in the past, no, you're just too dry for contact lenses, but you know, we're able to get them in just a daily lens that they can wear for date night. And you don't want to underestimate the impact that that can have on someone's confidence, self-esteem, just like, you know, they really appreciate that option. Absolutely. I wanted to say just something about patients being informed um, when we're really busy in our practices. One of the things that we're going to start doing is, um, and I'm sure if you guys, some of you probably have this in your practice already, but um, we're going to start having like a little it's like called an aura frame. It's a frame with all these pictures in it. And I just inherited it from my grandma. And I was like, what do I do with this frame? And it has these electronic pictures. So what we're going to do is put like, what is, what is up and coming? Like, what are the newest things? What are, oh, contact lenses for astigmatism. You can have those contact lenses for this contact lenses for that. And just have them kind of passively pass while the patient's sitting there. So that they know, because we found that we don't really have to be proactive about different things like I'll try a new contact lens solution and I'll post it on my Instagram page and a bunch of my patients follow me. And so they'll look at my Instagram and be like, hey, what about that new contact lens solution? And I'll be like, oh, right, okay. Cause I wasn't gonna bring it up, but since they brought it up and they're always bringing me stuff like that. And we, we thought that maybe that would be a good idea if you have you know, patients who have a lot of astigmatism and they just didn't think that contacts were for them. You could just put it passively in your waiting room and patients will be like, oh, can I hear about those contacts? Or like new contacts with, um, what's the new one? That, there's a new one that just came out and it's supposed to be like better for digital devices. So digital device contact lens wear. I love it. It's your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I love those tips because often, you know, we talked about it before. Often we, it's not top of mind for us because it's, you know, it's not new to us. But I would have so many patients that came in that said, oh, I can't wear contact lenses because I have astigmatism, or they would call it, you know, any number of things, um, astigmata or whatever, <laughs> they get those confused. But, you know, it's a great reminder for them and almost that passive reminder. So I love that tip because um, it also can save you time too, you know, your chair time because they, they're passively um, absorbing that information or whether maybe it's on social media, your website, or even just in, in, in your office. So those are great tips. I did want to take um, one of the questions. So I know we're, we're running it down on time, but you know, to all of you, I know, I know staff can be an issue for, for all of us um, this day and age, but you know, what tips can you share about how you're working with your staff and, and, you know, I, I heard um, Dr. Denton Dabrowski talking about that being her house and um, ensuring that there's a culture, I'm assuming, within within your staff. So is there any, any tips that you can share about how you use your staff to improve patient experiences? So I'll be happy to start. I am huge on this. Number one, my staff is the best. I'll put them up against anybody, but it's also because I expect that of them, but I also foster growth and I, I do a lot of training and, and we really care about our patients as a team. And I know all of you do in your practices as well, but one of the little things that I would say you can do, and I have an example of this from last week, we recently had a patient who came in, she um, decided to go to a telemedicine practice that had opened up in town. 
and ended up getting fit in lenses. And just she did not have a great experience, did not feel cared for the way she had in my practice. Um, and, you know, told the people at that practice that she was going to go back to her bougie eye doctor, which I'm like, okay, that's fine. You can call me that. I am kind of bougie. Um, but we treat you really well, like really, really well. But that was a point of pride. Like she told my tech and my front desk that. And they came and got me and said, oh, wait till you hear this. She's so excited to see you. She's paying out of pocket to see you. Um, and that's because of my incredible team and the education and the environment and all of those things we talked about earlier that are so important and the extra value that we give in contact lenses. And, and what I did with that experience was I made sure that we all celebrated that together because that was something to celebrate as a team. And I think when you proactively share those wins, it ingrains in your team and they want more of that. And I think that that's a very positive influence on your practice and patients. I'd love to echo what you said, Melanie, and because great teamwork and staff work does not come by accident. It comes with intention and effort. Uh, years ago, I counted how many potential staff patient interactions there were from the time a patient called to the time they had their exam and left. And in our setting, it was 19. I would love to tell you that's 19 opportunities to impress the patient. No, it's 19 opportunities to impress the patient. You have to make sure that at every step, every single person is positive, energized, knows the messaging of, of the practice at that moment in time to have an effective team. It is not by accident. Just to, you know, I guess pile on that you know, even more, but, you know, for, you know, for our practice, you know, we all right. It has, you know, em empowering the patients like right in the mission statement and then the staff, the very first day, you know, they it's much more about culture on the first day than it is about paperwork. There is some paperwork, but it's much more about, you know, spending time with them and making sure that they get to know, you know, how we do things and, and why we do things and how it's really all about the patient and the patient experience. And we want them to, you know, feel that way and, and believe it and personify that just exactly uh, like Dr. Levin said, because every encounter, you know, should hopefully be great, but it, you know, it may not every, you know, every, every touch point. And, um, and so we try to uh, balance, you know, that, that culture and that vibe with, with a fair number of meetings, you know, I mean, we have tiny little meetings in the morning, just the huddle to make sure that we're doing well. We have um, team meetings, which are weekly so that they can keep track of details. And then once a month, we have an all staff meeting. It's a little bit tricky because we have multiple locations. So we have to do, do it over Zoom and it's a little bit of a mess. But in the times when we have let those meetings slide, you know, it doesn't take long before cracks start to start to show. And then we got to get right, you know, right back on it. And I'm amazed at some offices that I think of as very high performing practices that just don't take advantage of meetings and they don't have to be awful. They don't have to be more than a half an hour, but I just think it is absolutely critical for working with staff, you know, repetition and empowering them. There's a zillion ways that we do it, but I, I think that both those one-on-one -on -one and full practice, you know, you have to have both. And Nathan, I think that's a great uh, that's a great point of having the staff meetings because I'm in a business group and that's what they always say is that you should have these periodic staff meetings and I definitely don't have those as frequently as I should and I think it keeps your staff morale up. Um, we do have a um, we have our receptionist remote so that the front desk person doesn't have to answer phones during the day. So we have somebody that answers phones just from her own home, and um, that is a. Uh, what I wanted to do with her is that my staff is amazing and my biggest fear is if they quit and then I have to train somebody else. Um, but so my big thing is like writing stuff down. So if I have like lenses, like all of my lens offerings, I actually wrote down on a piece of paper, like this is this type of lens. This is what it does. This is, this is the type of conditions that it treats. And then I made like a huge document that I give, I gave to, um, her when I was training her about like, hey, if someone calls in with keratoconus, um, maybe you say, oh, 
you might be a number of, you might be eligible for a number of different lenses. You might be good for a scleral lens, a GP lens. And just having that knowledge is writing it down makes it so much easier. So God forbid you have to fill in, have somebody fill in at your office. They can maybe quickly read this document and be like, oh, what we're, the new thing at the office is that we're offering this new soft lens that has a better wedding angle or has like a higher oxygen permeability and like telling that to patients, oh, maybe, oh, hey, you're gonna book an appointment. I see you're wearing contacts. We have a new lens that you might be interested in. We'll talk about it when you get here. Just like things like that to kind of put the, again, planting the seed, but instead of like having to go over it with every single employee that you have or having them retain it in a certain way, just like writing it down, giving it out, and then being like, do you have any questions about this? These are all really great tips. So um, thank you all for sharing them. And again, you know, at the CLI, we all in, from CLI, we, you know, we encourage you to download our full report at ctomorrownow.com. And you can also look at our past reports on that website there too. And our goal always is to help you and your patients be more successful. And this report is just one, one more way we're working to help advance patient care. So I'm Carissa Lee, and on behalf of the entire CLI board, representing Johnson & Johnson Vision, Alcon, Bausch & Loam, and Cooper Vision, um, and on behalf of our great visionary doctors that we had this evening, thank you for attending. And please note, we'll be back in 2023 with more See Tomorrow research. Thank you and have a great evening.